I want to be blunt. When I go, when I first went to the museum as a kid and I saw these mummies, mm -hmm. I was enormously fascinated, mm -hmm. <laughs> and by the tomb. Why is that? Why are people so fascinated by these things? Well, you're right that Egypt has um, has had this allure for for millennia, and certainly mm -hmm. since the 1920s. Mm -hmm. I think it's because Egypt never reveals all her secrets. There's mm -hmm. always still some secret that's still left to be discovered, and mm -hmm. this is from everything. Um, Egypt covers everything up with the sand. With, you know, mm -hmm. the Sphinx was covered with sand up to here at uh -huh. one point. Mm -hmm. So it's understanding that there's more than meets the eye, right. that these symbols mean more than they may appear to mean. Uh -huh. I think this is a perfect point to uncover the sands from ancient Egypt a bit mm -hmm. and do another shot, this time of the museum. We have some very interesting things for you to see in this museum, so here we go. Now this is the front of the uh, museum. Mm -hmm. It's a beautiful place. We're zooming in on the entry there. Anything you'd like to say? Well, this is modeled after the Temple of Amun at Karnak, and uh, uh, it's uh, uh, this drawing scroll. Oh, welcome. Yeah, thank you. Good to have you with us. Can I come in and see your collection? Absolutely, please do. The statue that you see behind me here is one of the rarest pieces in the museum collection. It's a statue of Cleopatra VII, the famous Cleopatra. And it's actually one of only seven remaining statues of Cleopatra in the entire world. Here we have the mummified head of an apis bull. Now the apis bull was believed to be the living incarnation of the god Ptah and lived in the town of Memphis. And when one apis bull died, he was mummified, just like a king would be in the form of a god, and the priests would search the country for the new apis bull. When he was found, he would be brought to the palace to live as the new apis bull. Behind me, we have two of the most beautiful coffins in the museum collection. They're from the Sayite period in Egypt. Over here, we have the coffin of Usurmantu, and beside him is the coffin of his first cousin, the Lady Ta'awa Sharit. Both of them were from the very powerful Besenmut family in Thebes. And it's within the coffin of Usurmantu that we found the museum's unwrapped Egyptian mummy. The mummy that you see before you is one of the four mummies we have on display here at the Rosicrucian Egyptian Museum. Now, as you can see, this mummy has been completely unwrapped. However, we did not do this to him. He came to the museum this way. And as a result, we don't know his name. We're not sure of his occupation, and we can only guess about when he may have lived. Now, he arrived at the museum in the coffin of Usurmantu. However, we believe that it is most probably not him. Janae, can you explain to us what this is? Yeah, the Rosicrucian Egyptian Museum is also home to a full-scale replica rock cut tomb. Now, in the late 1930s, as well as the 1960s, the Rosicrucian Order sponsored a number of camera expeditions to Egypt in an area called Beni Hassan. Now, in Beni Hassan, you have a number of tombs of the nobles, and they photographed about 40 different tombs. Of those, 15 were in very good condition, so they took the most pictures of those 15, brought them back to the museum, and used those images to create the tomb that you see here. Wow. Could I go in? Absolutely. Follow me. Oh, great. Sirdab statue would be to provide a place where the deceased could look out and make sure that everyone was bringing him the proper amount of food so that he would be able to eat in the afterlife. And if you follow me down, here we can go down into the burial chamber. So we're now down 
down in the burial chamber of our replica rock cut tomb. And over here on this wall, you can see the images that our deceased has painted of all his future servants performing the tasks that he's going to have them assigned in the next life so he won't have to do any work himself. And if you come over here on this wall, you can see our tomb owner performing one of his favorite sports, hunting. So he would take these birds in his hand, shake them until they make a bunch of noise, which would stir up the rest of these wild birds. And he would take his hunting stick and throw it at them. And if he happened to knock one out of the sky, his hunting cat would go get it. Now in the middle of this tomb, we have our sarcophagus. Now this type of sarcophagus would have been reserved for the pharaoh, someone who'd receive it as a gift from the pharaoh, or for the apis bull. And as you can see, they're very large, and they wouldn't have been buried because they didn't think that tomb robbers would be able to get into them as easily. But as you can see, they've gotten them. Stephen Armstrong is the curator of the uh, Rosicrucian Egyptian Museum. And uh, Stephen Armstrong, well, <laughs> Mr. Armstrong, thank you so much for inviting me here. It's been wonderful. Well, we've enjoyed your visit very much. We're happy you were able to be with us. Yeah. Mr. Armstrong, I see all these wonderful things which are relevant and uh, significant with symbolism. How are the artifacts here relevant to your philosophy of life today? Well, for me, to realize that people 5,000 years ago uh, loved life, sought immortality, and enjoyed their families and friends, just as we do today, really gives me a sense of the commonality of humanity across all of time and space. And I think in particular, the yearning for transcendence, the yearning for spirituality, is something that is so important to us today, especially as we're surrounded by technology, which of course makes so many wonderful things possible, and yet we must make sure that we don't lose the ideals that have been part of humanity from the very dawn of time as evidenced here at our Rosicrucian Egyptian Museum. What a wonderful way to put it. <laughs> thank you so much for having me here. Oh, it's been a joy. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Um, I think the theme of what we just saw was immortality of the soul. Um, I've had two guests on this show who have had near-death experiences and I've read a little bit about uh, the Egyptian view of uh, life and death and the car, I can't remember what's the car, the ba that leaves the body and it is able to go through solid substances and it's able to turn back and look at the image of itself. Um, I just find that tremendously interesting that there are people today who have the actual experience that the Egyptians seem to have had and yet it takes um, a brush with death to experience that. How did the Egypt how are the Egyptians aware of this phenomenon that the soul is eternal? Well, that's a subject that a lot of people are very interested in and presenting different perspectives on. Mm -hmm. For some Egyptologists, they they really don't give the e ancient Egyptians a lot of credit for the complexity of their belief system. Mm -hmm. However, there are many today that are seeing the similarities with the shamanic tradition mm -hmm. and the understanding of going to another plane of consciousness or another plane of awareness and returning with the ability to uh, communicate with, uh, communicate just beyond what's in our local area to heal. Mm -hmm. And they understood the place that you went to after you passed on, it was a place called Duat that not only was the place of death, it also was a place like an acorn has the potential for all of life. Mm -hmm. They saw it as that. It was also a place of incredible potential. So their belief system was actually very complex and um, very profound. And it included not just the two aspects of the soul that you mentioned, mm -hmm. a total of five aspects of the soul that had um, varia that, that uh, went to various areas and had different experiences after the end of their physical body. Mm -hmm. I have a lot of technical friends who, again, <laughs> I keep bringing this up, but they pursue the scientific method I think to their own detriment, you know, so that uh, feelings suffer. And I think after a while, you know, after, after 
you're going through the process of just, you know, pushing feelings aside and, you know, relying on so-called facts, that after a while, many of them don't know who they are anymore. Do you see that? I do. I, I see that in some people I know. Well, this is a pendulum that keeps shifting back and forth, and it's actually... Uh, in the 1600s, when the Rosicrucians first made our presence known, mm -hmm. this was a time of great superstition and uh, religious intolerance. Mm -hmm. And it really, in order to be able to survive and to present ideas that were not superstitious, everything had to be presented in a very scientific uh, way that could be uh, validated without any emotion or even any subjectivity in mm -hmm. it. So we've mm -hmm. kind of taken it from one extreme to the next, and uh, certainly a lot of the greatest scientists see that when you get down to the core of you know, even a cell or the body, you get to something that you just keep going deeper and deeper, and you find energy and information and mm -hmm. something that really just can never be pinpointed. Mm -hmm. there's, there's always that great mystery. Right. At the end of uh, Rosicrucian studies, um, one comes to a knowledge, I'm told. And the knowledge is a kind of gnosis. It, it's a kind of knowing. And it, I understand it's uh, not definable. But could you tell us something about it? Well, uh, there really is no end to Rosicrucian studies. Even when uh -huh. we complete the lessons, that it, it takes many, many years to complete all mm -hmm. the lessons and to participate in the various initiations which take place as you progress in our studies. Even mm -hmm. then, we look at the earliest lessons again with a completely new perspective. Mm -hmm. So there is no... It, it's. It's developing other ways of understanding beyond just the intellectual, and there's right. no end to that. Right. On your website, there is uh, an interesting quote from the Quran that uh, I looked at, had to read it several times before I got it. The quote is, And in the shifting of the winds and in the clouds that are pressed into service betwixt heaven and earth are signs to people who can understand. There are signs to people who can understand. In 1843, Edward's estranged mother passed away, finally. Now a baronet for his services to literature, Edward inherited his family home of Nebworth Castle and soon became known for hosting many sumptuous parties for the cream of London literary society. Amongst the many young authors invited were Wilkie Collins and his friend, Charles Dickens. There is some debate over when Edward had his first meeting with Charles Dickens. Whenever it was, either through a shared publisher called Henry Colburn, or later through mutual friends, the two struck up a great rapport. At the time, Bulwer Lytton was the senior, more famous writer, and he became one of Dickens' early champions. In fact, in 1861, he persuaded Charles to change the original downbeat ending of Great Expectations into something happier and more romantic, somewhere where Pip marries Estella and lives happily ever after. Charles, in turn, named his tenth and last child after Edward, and it once described him as the most brilliant conversationalist of his age. Edward was also making a number of influential friends in politics. The great Victorian statesman, Benjamin Disraeli, himself also a noted novelist, persuaded Edward to stand for election as a Conservative in Hartford. When he ran for re-election in 1858, Rosina frequently appeared at the hustings to loudly denounce him. Eventually she was arrested, bound over and placed in an asylum for several weeks until liberated by friends. In the meantime, Edward was returned as MP and served as Secretary of State for the colonies. Eventually he would take a peerage and sit in the Lords as Baron Lytton of Nebworth. Not that he let his political roles interfere with his writing, like many wealthy Victorians, Edward had an interest in the occult and this came through into several of his books. 
In Zanoi, for instance, about a handsome young man who seems to have discovered the secret of eternal life. Or a strange story in which a doctor has to outwit a rival who has terrible magical powers. But it was the coming race that really established his reputation in the fantasy field. In this, a young American traveller discovers a secret civilization underground, ruled by a race of super beings known as the Vril Yar. The Vril Yar use a substance called Vril to give them incredible powers, and it can also be used as a terrible weapon. The book is partially a comment on the new ideas of Darwinism that were coming into the popular debate, and also the growing feminist movement. It was the face of man, but yet of a type of man distinct from our known extant races. The nearest approach to it in outline and expression is the face of the sculptured Sphinx, so regular in its calm, intellectual, mysterious beauty, with large black eyes, deep and brilliant, and brows arched. A nameless something in the aspect, tranquil though the expression, and beauteous though the features, roused that instinct of danger which the sight of a tiger or serpent arouses. As it drew near, a cold shudder came over me. I fell on my knees and covered my face with my hands. The book was enormously popular and even prompted a brief fashion for Vril products, one of which is still with us today. Bovril, bovine and Vril. More disturbingly, although Bulwer intended the book to be purist fiction, some people took it seriously and believed that there really was a super race beneath us. The book was very popular amongst Nazi occultists, possibly who felt that an Aryan super race waiting to inherit the earth was somehow an attractive idea. In fact, it's even rumoured that Hitler authorised many expeditions into mines across Europe searching for an entrance to the land of the Brillard. His novels were being translated into many languages across Europe and in fact Ernest Maltravers became the first English language book to be translated into Japanese. His House of Lords career was relatively quiet and he was spending more time researching into esoteric matters. As part of this, he became a founding member of the English Rosicrucian Society, a group of men interested in studying ancient practices such as astrology and alchemy. The stories of history's dark fellowships strike fear into many hearts. But what are the truths behind the stories? <laughs> Throughout history, there have been secret organizations striving for influence in political circles. But if the bizarre legends about the Brill Society are true, the organization is particularly unsettling. The Brill Society is the most mysterious uh, German secret society ever in history. Uh, they were originally founded before the Second World War, and their influence uh, reaches out even till today. Its members are said to have included senior figures in the Nazi party, like Hermann Goering, Heinrich Himmler, and even Adolf Hitler. The Vril Society was a dark fellowship. They sought to achieve the mastery of the Aryan race. Before they were able to influence the Nazis, Vril occultists worked in complete secrecy, doing anything to promote Aryan power. What they did uh, that ranged from straightforward political assassinations, trying to evoke the spirits of the dead, good old-fashioned, what one might call, sexual orgies, and, more sinisterly, human sacrifice. Michael Fitzgerald is one of just a few historians willing to identify the secrets of the Vril Society. Few records exist but he claims first-hand sources. Some of my information about the Real Society has come from 
direct sources. Some of them swore me to secrecy during their lifetime and have now died. So he is now free to offer his assessment. The Drill Society was a group of people founded at the end of the First World War and it included many people who were to go on to become prominent in the Nazi party. Like any secret society, it had its secret practices. But what made the Vril Society so unique was its members' obsession with an intangible power force called Vril. This power was universal energy. It could do anything. All currents of harm and healing and so on were enclosed within it. It's similar to the Indian concept of prana in many ways, or the Chinese concept of qi. Chinese philosophers believe that qi is the life energy that runs through us all. The Vril Society believed they could harness this energy. And they believed that Vril power could be used to gain material power. So they were frantically searching for this Vril force. Dutchman Theo Pymans has dedicated 25 years of his life to studying the Vril Society. My research has established that a certain bureaus in Nazi Germany were frantically searching for this new uh, energy. Obtaining supernatural power might require supernatural efforts. They sought the power of rule through a variety of different means. There were naturally meditative practices which were obviously the mainstay of most of their activities. But they weren't meditating to gain inner peace. The theory is that they practice these meditation techniques in order to further the, the, the strength of the will in themselves. If it was a strength that could potentially dominate the world, wouldn't the members of the real society have done more than esoteric meditation to attain it? They were also very involved with what might I call loosely sex magic. There's an enormous history of sexual magic going back to witches and witches using sexual powers. This is nothing new. Members of the society are said to have used the magic of sex to summon the power of Vril. There were some sexual practices that went on in the Vril society. This carnal method of harvesting Vril was less magical and closer to an excuse for swapping partners. I was swingers. <laughs> Group sex and meditation couldn't really be considered evil and were not exactly unique in the early 20th century. But the real society may have had more sinister rituals. The darkest side of the real was undoubtedly their belief, which dates back many thousands of years, that to sacrifice a young child will give more power than anything else if you're turning to the darkness, and that is what they did. After the First World War, many illegitimate and orphan children lived in Bavaria. Children whose disappearance would go unnoticed. And legend had it that the vril of a child was the most concentrated and most powerful. They were seen as being gateways between the astral and the material world in a way that adults were not. So consequently, they were ideal victims for human sacrifice. For human sacrifice. Human sacrifices to harness an intangible energy. Where did this real notion come from? The bizarre concept had been hijacked and distorted from a science fiction novel after the First World War, a bizarre cult called the Vril Society flourished in Germany. It took its name from a supernatural force, Vril, that could bestow immense power on anyone who could harness it. The concept of Vril was expounded in a book published in 1871 called The Coming Race, written by Edward Bulwer Lytton. Could it be that some aspects of Nazi philosophy stem from ideas in a science fiction novel? Lytton's novel, The Coming Race, in many respects precursored at least some of the ideology that led to the final solution. 
this superior race, which is explicitly linked in the book with the Aryan races, um, can, can manifest and can, can control. And that just struck a chord in Europe particularly. And following the devastation suffered from World War I, some Germans desperately wanted to associate themselves with such a superior race. Perhaps nobody could believe that this science fiction was fiction. At the end of the book comes with a very serious warning. These subterranean keepers of the Vril could destroy mankind. Should they come up and decide they wanted to colonize the surface of the planet, we would be doomed. It may seem a kind of tabloid truth that one would expect to find in sensational newspapers, but the rural society really were consciously dedicated to the service of evil, and by their impact on the founders of the Nazi party, they instilled that evil into the senior leadership of what was to become the most evil regime in the 20th century. Most sources say that the Vril Society was founded in 1918 at a mysterious meeting in the Bavarian town of Berchtesgaden. It was a holiday center and would later house the country retreat of Adolf Hitler. It is said that in a mountain lodge, a group of occultists and high-ranking German nationalists secretly gathered to create a powerful inner circle called the All-German Society for Metaphysics, otherwise known as the Vril Society. <laughs> Essentially, it was founded by uh, two people, Rudolf von Sebottendorf. Von Sebottendorf had been very active in the occult movement. He was a Freemason, an alchemist, and the founder of the Tula Society. Their belief in a mythical civilization was a precursor to Nazi Aryan ideas. The real name was Adam Glauer, who was the son of an engine driver, but he gave himself, awarded himself a title of nobility. <laughs> In creating the Vril Society, von Sebottendorf was joined by a man who would darkly influence world history. The other main person within it was Dietrich Eckhart. He was said to have strong powers of persuasion, particularly in his anti-Semitic writings. Dietrich Eckhart was Hitler's closest personal friend between 1918 and his death in 1923. Eckhart believed he was paving the road for Germany's own saviour. He was, in many respects, a mad genius. It's no accident he spent a great part of his time in and out of mental institutions. The founder of the Vril went by a very curious name. John the Baptist. And we all know that in the Bible, John Baptist is a sort of uh, paver of the road for the true Messiah. Eckhart was also one of the masterminds behind the Nazi party. Eckhart saw Hitler as the German messiah. He saw him as the man sent to save the country. And he wasn't the only Vril founder who felt that way. It has been suggested that these two men were joined by two women, mediums responsible for finding the hidden occult truths and harvesting Vril. In those days, it was the golden age of what was known as the physical mediumship, where not only were they forever moving objects and table turning and photic levitating, but also they used to produce a substance called ectoplasm out of their bodies. One of these mediums is said to have predicted the new German messiah. During her state of trance, she declared that the apparition she had given form to was going to be the next German messiah, who she proceeded to name as Adolf Hitler. So the real society may have indeed paved the way for the person they would promote as the country's messiah. Their next step would have been to secure his ultimate weapon, Vril. They believed that that would give them power. This occult group of German nationalists may have grown quickly to become an elite inner circle of the Nazi party. 
many of the top leaders, including Hitler himself, were members of the Vril Society. Karl Harra, Anton Drexler and Dietrich Eckhart are three of the most important figures in the transition from the Vril Society to the Nazi Party. Eckhart was considered the darkest of them all and dedicated to Hitler's success. He did have certain perverse gifts and not least of which was his ability to uh, train Hitler in the use of you know what one might loosely call the power of a human heart and human mind. Hermann Göring, commander of the Luftwaffe, was said to be a member. It is virtually certain that he was introduced to it in around 1920, probably by Dietrich Eckhart. Alfred Rosenberg, minister of the Third Reich, probably a member. Rosenberg believed that the Aryan race was superior to every other, of course. And, you know, he believed that Jesus was not Jewish, but an Aryan. Rudolf Hess, deputy Führer, another likely member. Hess believed everything. He used to sleep with magnets under his bed to try and draw off harmful emanations. Martin Bormann, chief of the Nazi party chancellery, also thought to be a member. Martin Bormann was probably considered the most evil one. He was an avowed and open Satanist. He was quite categorical about his desire to exterminate Christianity as well as Judaism because he saw Christianity as simply, as he called it, a Jewish perversion. And the most senior Nazi in the Vril Society, Adolf Hitler himself. Hitler was, by definition, a dark person, but he took advantage of the dark fellowship of the Vril Society for his own ends. Hitler is said to have used the frenzy surrounding this occult group to his advantage, manipulating its members. Not one of the members had an iota of his ruthlessness and, in a sense, intelligence. Hitler used any means that he could, including the occult fanaticism of the era, as a tool to help his rise to the top. And he saw the whole thing consciously as a means to an end, which was the transformation of Germany and the establishment of himself as its leader. But he did have some deep occult beliefs of his own. He believed to a considerable extent that occult forces, or whatever one likes to call them, the Thrillbauer, had some kind of reality. Some believe his first occult exposure happened just before World War I in Vienna, when he met a man named Lance von Liebenfels. Von Liebenfels thought Hitler was a natural medium. Von Liebenfels was obsessed with the Aryan occult. He was known to frequent the ancient town of Carnuntum in Austria, where the Germans defeated the Romans in the first century. He invented a whole new religion that he called Ariosophy. <laughs> and he made his bizarre beliefs known publicly. He published a magazine called Ostara, which was full of racial ramblings and bizarre uh, occult philosophy. Hitler was allegedly an avid reader of Liebenfeld's pamphlet. He actually physically advocated that the Jews should be killed simply for being Jewish. With this racist teaching, Hitler was one step closer to Vril and the final solution. <laughs> How is it possible that a dark fellowship as bizarre as the Vril Society could even exist, let alone contribute to the most evil regime in modern history? It has had an influence on world history out of all proportion. The confusion surrounding the era offers clues to the Vril Society's influence. It was a very convoluted time. There were a multitude of secret societies. 
From about 1888, well into the 1920s, hundreds of secret societies formed, reformed, and gave birth to new and even more secret subgroups. Some were dangerous nationalistic orders, like the Serbian Black Hand Society, responsible for the assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand of Austria. Black Hand Society was largely responsible for the First World War. And many of the era's dark fellowships were simply racist, sharing the sentiments of Lance von Liebenfels, who believed Aryans were gods. He also believed that the Jews were literally children of the devil. The 30 years leading to the formation of the Vril Society was an era obsessed with the strange combination of racial solidarity and the occult. Magic and occult ideas dominated thinking of virtually every class of society in the late 19th century. But of all the mystics of the time, one person's writings may have been the genesis of the phenomenal occult frenzy. Madame Elaine Patrova Blavatsky. I would say that Blavatsky provided the metaphysical framework that has gathered together the vast, vast streams of the ancient wisdom into a coherent system. Blavatsky founded the Theosophical Society in 1875 and established herself as a kind of sage in the occult realm. Theosophists believe in a combination of Asian and occult ideas to promote the concept of a superior Aryan race. She traveled throughout the world for spiritual reasons. Madame Blavatsky wrote, well, several books, but the particularly influential one was The Secret Doctrine. It was based on knowledge she acquired in India and Tibet. She claimed that she got her teachings from secret messages from Mahatmas in the Himalayas. This groundbreaking book, written in 1885, did something no other book had ever done. It combined science and religion. Some branches of late 19th century European philosophy drew inspiration from a combination of the occult and Eastern mysticism. One leading proponent of these concepts was Madame Patrova Blavatsky, who managed to combine the precepts of both religion and science. Suddenly science, like with Darwin, had seemed to destroy the possibility of religion and Blavatsky was showing, oh, you can still be believing in evolution and yet be religious because it was, this is how it works, you know. Her writings included anti-Semitic notions that fueled later groups like the Vril Society. The secret doctrine had an extreme racist view some interpret her writings to say that Semitic people had not evolved as far as the Aryans. But she was actually writing of the ancient Aryans, whose Indo-Iranian name means noble. They had simply migrated further than other races, and so they were more evolved. The misrepresentation of Aryan was we are the master race. Blavatsky's ancient Aryans were not the same as Hitler's 20th century Aryan race. The secret doctrine clearly has anti-Semitic and racist undertones. This is the danger of letting out high-level truths because of the danger of misrepresentation. The secret doctrine was written as a spiritual teaching and a kind of esoteric study of evolution, not an inspiration for the master race. But the racial aspects were the ones that particularly obviously appealed to the Nazis. The world has shown the ghastly effects of twisting what is sacred knowledge and perverting it to one's own personal ends. When the Vril Society was founded, Blavatsky's teachings were more popular in Germany than anywhere else in the world. Seriously, it was that influential on German thought, it really was. Like the coming race, Blavatsky's book was misunderstood and its ideas were twisted to support the many other racist philosophies rampant in Europe. So, by 1918, the time was ripe for the formation of the Vril Society and the search for ultimate power. Vril, Vril, Vril. The Vril Society saw this power as a kind of metaphysical petrol. The Germans needed it because Germany, as we know, did not have fossil fuel reserves. 
they had a method of creating uh, synthetic fuels, but they were in desperate need for other energies. In addition to their occult methods for finding this energy, they began an actual quest for the all-important Vril. They followed in Blavatsky's footsteps to Tibet. Vril Society member Karl Haushofer organized expeditions to Tibet beginning in 1923. Their mission? Contacting the Aryan forefathers in the cities deep underneath the Himalayas. They would certainly be the guardians of the Vril. And by the third trip, they were measuring the skulls of the locals, convinced the Tibetans were the Aryan ancestors. Eventually, Hitler formed a Nazi organization to track the Aryan race. They spent more money on that than the United States did on the development of the atomic bomb. That would be $20 billion in today's terms. For work that frankly produced no tangible results. And so, in the end, the Germans left. But whether they found Vril there or not, the Germans did bring back one very important thing from Tibetan culture, something Blavatsky had waxed poetic about in The Secret Doctrine. Within its mystical precincts lies the master key which opens the door of every science, physical as well as spiritual. How could Madame Blavatsky have known this mystical figure would become the symbol of hate? A great many of the Vril Society members were conscious Satanists. And these evil men were emblazoned with a symbol, the swastika. Its mystical resonance was of great interest to the Vril Society, and by 1920, it would virtually belong to the Nazis. Previously, though, the swastika had been a symbol of luck and good fortune in Asia. A lot of persons these days forget that before it became an ominous symbol in Nazi Germany, the swastika was to be found everywhere. It was originally meant as a symbol of good fortune. It took on a very tangible meaning, that of the letter G, and for Freemasons, the word geometry. Well, not only did it stand for geometry and math and so on, but it stood for Nordic, the old Norse gods. It was a symbol of Thor. There was a village in Canada called the Swastika, and they had a female hockey team called the Swastikas, with the Swastika embroidered on their skirts, and it makes very lovely photos. By 1920, it was no longer a benign symbol. In adopting the Swastika, the Nazis did make one significant alteration. Hitler and his cohorts did a funny thing. They changed the direction of the Swastika. It no longer turned to the right. His concept of the Swastika was very influential. Hitler's swastika turned in the opposite direction, to the left, and the left-hand path is synonymous with evil. The left-hand path, which is something that clearly uh, derives from Roman mythology, and in fact all mythologies, where the evil gods are centered on the left side and the good gods are centered on the right side. This is Hitler's swastika in 1920. It quickly became embedded in Nazi culture, and a variation of it has become known as a sign of the real society. It's found here, in Wevelsberg Castle, the home of Heinrich Himmler, commander of the SS and a suspected member of the Vril Society. He was frantically searching for various means of winning the war. And in the end, one can say it turned him insane. Although, in my opinion, the seeds of his insanity were already there. course was probably the most lunatic of any senior Nazi party member. He was mystical, he was a dreamer. He was a real junkie for every cult and wacky idea going. And he was an architect of Nazi ideology. There are fascinating photos and this I've never understood of Himmler with his 12-year-old daughter visiting a concentration camp, a death camp. Now, who on earth would take a stuff or old author to a death camp? Perhaps only a man obsessed with absolute power would do that. And such a man would be the perfect candidate to renovate a 16th century castle as a real centerpiece. Within this castle, we find a richness of symbols, of signs, and of occult 
things of significance that point towards his, well, the fulfillment of his dreams. The North Tower holds the darkest symbols. The North Tower clearly is the embodiment of all that Himmler felt was dear and precious to him, and it points towards an occult significance uh, in his philosophies. A feature of the tower was the solar wheel, or black sun, the occult symbol for the real society. Clearly this sun wheel meant a great deal to Heinrich Himmler. What the solar wheel exactly was, who can tell? It was, however, likely to impress members of the SS visiting the castle. The SS was seen by Himmler as being part of a mystical order. Himmler wanted an imposing headquarters for his SS cohorts. He performed weddings and funerals for them here. It's alleged that even the full black mass was said to have been performed uh, at Wewelsburg on two or three occasions. But if that ultimate satanic ritual was celebrated at Wewelsburg, it would have been undertaken in another part of the tower, the crypt. In this bizarre room with its excellent acoustics, Himmler created a frightening arena for his elite SS men. There were pedestals around the sides placed possibly for attending rituals and real society meetings, and a peculiar space in the center, probably for Himmler himself. But this is funny in the sense that if this is the center where the acoustics work the best and the most, then what was this, the purpose of the center meant for? Would that have been the place where Heinrich Himmler told about his wildest dreams? Was this nightmarish place the focus of all things real? Did Himmler have it constructed to be the place where the most despicable rituals could take place? This, of course, is one of these things that one will never know for certain. Was it here that Himmler held his notorious real experiments? This quack doctor called Rasha, who used to literally freeze prisoners until they were on the point of death, and then he would put naked prostitutes against their bodies to see if that would revive them, and then, if so, they were then instructed to have sex with them, and then all the temperatures would be taken. Himmler called it animal magnetism, but it was essentially Vril-based. Himmler may have been searching for Vril through sexuality. Of course, it was ridiculous because 50% of the male subjects used to die. The experiments were undoubtedly inspired by Himmler's subscription to the notion of Vril. Were these experiments held here, in Himmler's center, or elsewhere within the castle walls? Unfortunately, there are no written records or living eyewitnesses to reveal with certainty exactly what occurred within the walls of Himmler's Wittelsburg. The real society was unique among the secret societies of the era. One reason was that it included women as members. Every woman in the Reich stands ready as any man to fight and die in the service of the fatherland. And, you know, this is true, this is true. There were probably more women than there were men in many respects. Which is very important to realize because a lot of the Masonic groups were male only and a lot of the esoteric groups were male only. But not the real society. After all, the females in the coming race were superior to the males. Women were seen, really, in a way, as being like almost divine. Women would have been welcomed because their feminine energy was required to properly attain Vril. But Hitler's personal view was far more practical. He actually felt that women were actually the soul of the nation and that they were going to c c carry on the legacy of National Socialism. It is believed that two women became senior leaders of the real society. Countess von Reventlow was possibly the most well-known one. And it's possible that her prominence led to her death. She suffered a mysterious and fatal bicycle accident in 1918, shortly after the Vril Society's inauguration. As she got um, executed. Countess von Riffenlauf's assassins were members of the German Communist Party, people strongly opposed to the National Socialists. 
Ludendorff's wife, who was the only other one that was of comparable importance, she broke with the Brill Society at a fairly early stage. That may have been when her husband, Eric Ludendorff, became disillusioned with politics and left the Brill Society and the Nazi Party in 1923. Most of the women in the Brill Society served two primary purposes. Sex was seen as a national duty. Following World War I, one primary purpose of women in Germany was to replace the lost soldiers by having many German babies. There was actually a huge drive towards birth to increase productivity. And the prospect of making babies took on an element of fun at the time. Anything that could be an escape or fun would be good. The real society may have taken fun a step further into sex for occult power. It's combined power with pleasure. It was kind of like nationalization of the sexual instinct. And in a dark fellowship, sexual instinct might invite sexual magic. Women in the real society were often mediums. In an era obsessed with the occult, there were many practicing mediums. And mediums were typically women. With secret societies dabbling in the occult rampant throughout Germany in the 1930s, successful mediums were in great demand. And the real society held such women in high esteem. They were considered to be particularly receptive channels between the ordinary world and the astral world. Well, it sounds like a fascinating uh, and novel concept, but clearly it is not. I mean, in Germany, we have female mediums doing exactly that. They didn't have any political influence in any way, and that what they essentially did was try and channel in the real power and then translate it out into the rest of the people in the room. A kind of psychic photosynthesis, one might say. One bizarre legend suggests that the female founders of the group were receiving messages about Vril from other galaxies. Well, it's been alleged that, um, that, that the Vril Society was able to contact beings from Aldebaran and so on. That depends to a certain extent on your point of view. It's not strange that these ideas would evolve or mutate into ideas of uh, long-haired women communicating with people underneath the earth and on other planets. Why not? It makes a better story. It's more fun. The idea of two long-haired mediums communicating with other galaxies through automatic writing was not so outrageous in 1918. There is this fascinating book that I held in my hand just yesterday. It was published in 1823, and it's called uh, Voyages to the Sun, the, uh, the Moon, and Other Planets. And it was written by a female medium at that time, 1823. So clearly the idea that two female mediums are involved in communicating with an interstellar civilization on Aldebaran in 1970 is not new. And long hair also had a long tradition. The long hair of the women is partly a throwback, of course, to the old days of the Valkyries, maidens and so on. I wonder how much of this uh, is borrowing themes from Wagner. Naturally, not all women of the real society were long-haired beauties. But all of the real society legends, like everything surrounding the organization, were larger than life. Exaggeration was part of the plan. And that exaggeration included Heinrich Himmler's nightmarish castle. This all could have been a stage prop, a setting, a fitting setting for Himmler's plans and Himmler's evil dreams. It's a very clever ploy of propaganda. Propaganda was an integral part of the entire Nazi culture. Ensuring that the Third Reich would survive in our darkest dreams. So what was real? And what, if anything, has become of the real society? The, the problem with uh, researching the real society today is that clearly uh, this concept attracts people of unsavory character. Today there are many people still obsessed with Nazis, Hitler and the most evil side of the occult. They intermingle legend, fantasy and propaganda with the scarce facts. 
Some also believe in the possibility that intergalactic flight could be achieved through the Vril Society. The Nazis were, at the very last two years of the war, working on secret projects. Their ultimate scheme was the Flying Disc Project, a concept based on Vril Society ideas. We can clearly read in the 1930 pamphlets published by uh, the Vril Society that, yes, there were blueprints. There is even a whole chapter explaining what uh, an ideal spaceship might look to them if the right technology was being used. Yeah, the real sources were actual blueprints. I know that devices were built with the technology that the Vril Society was propagating well before the Second World War. We don't know for sure whether Nazi scientists created flying saucers, but the Vril Society did envision them. Am I skeptical of the whole Nazi UFO myth? Yes. On the other hand, there are certain tales that I still find hard to discount. But the evidence has vanished. The strange thing is that we know that these devices were built, but we can't find them anywhere anymore. It has even been suggested that real technology was adapted for the US and Russian space programs. I don't think so. I think they would be further ahead than anybody else on this planet. So we're left to wonder what became of real technology and what became of the real society. Well, the irony of history is that Nazi Germany, towards the end of the world war, pretty much evolved into becoming the Vrilja themselves. In some ways, Hitler's Nazis did become a subterranean society. They built bunkers connecting one Nazi member to another and countless tunnels containing weapons factories. They did this, uh, as is the official stance, because uh, Allied bombers were bombing German cities and German factories into smithereens day after day, night after night. One place where they built weapons was the tunnel complex in Nordhausen. We know that they built their V1s and V2s there. Hundreds of very real V1 and V2 rockets built underground soared through the skies to destroy their enemies. It has been said that the V stands for Vril. If true, Nazis and the Vrilja have become one. My theory is that the search for this force changed themselves into, well, the carriers of the force. More than 60 years after the fall of the Third Reich, where are the remnants of the Vril society? Are they gone? Or are the ancient relics hiding away somewhere? Does a new regime exist among us, still plotting and scheming? When you look at the tapestry of signals that I'm receiving, that I have received over the years, one can say that yes, there still is a Vril Society, but not comparable to what it was once before. There still could be devotees of a fictional power amongst us today. Every year, hundreds of people are reported missing in national parks and forests, many of them children and most are eventually found whether dead or alive but a small percentage of the cases some right here in oregon are never solved the mystery those cases present has one man wondering if there's a common denominator behind the disappearances that have search and rescue crews continuing to scratch their heads we turned around and here was this little toddler walking out of the fog with absolutely no clothes on at all. Well, it's, it's troubling. Every month in almost every state, people go into the wilderness and don't come out. Stories like that are what fueled David Politis. Forever rifling newspaper archives and badgering federal agencies for public records, he's discovered more than 400 cases of people who wandered into the wilderness, but never came back. Uh, there are so many missing kids in Oregon, it's ridiculous. Accounts of children, people, vanishing, seemingly swallowed up by the many endless forests across America, or even later found in ways that defy logic. These were unusual things that don't make sense, that happened to cluster together, cluster together in three to four, sometimes as many as 20, 30, people missing at one location. He's mapped out what appear to be more than 30 clusters of vanishings in forests and national parks coast to coast. Some of those clusters and cases right here in Oregon. All of them documented and described in his two books. A 
According to Oregon State Police, there are 41 missing children in Oregon. And now also in the movie Missing 411, releasing in a couple of months. In a lot of these cases, search and rescue or the volunteers searching people have already gone over certain areas, not once, not twice, but even dozens of times. And then the child is found there, maybe a year, maybe a few years later. The search coordinators themselves are baffled by it too. The ones they don't think is criminal in nature. Once a cop, Politis got hooked on the inexplicable, intriguing and mysterious missing persons cases only after a government employee knocked on the door of his hotel near Park Service Land and confided in him, sharing stories about people disappearing at national parks like Crater Lake and Yosemite. The ranger described to me, if you were standing straight up and you just had your shirt, or just had your pants on and you melted directly into your pants, that's what it looked like to him. The pants were laying on the ground in a very neat pile. Just one of many accounts in his books that leave search crews wondering if they'll ever find closure. And after seven years of research, we found that they replicate themselves in these geographical clusters around the U.S., one of those clusters being Crater Lake. Ten years ago, COIN6 covered the search and rescue effort for eight-year-old Samuel Belke, who had a mild form of autism and feared loud noises and bright lights. So when Sammy darted away from his father near Cleetwood Cove at Crater Lake, the many searchers could not use the customary air horns and whistles to try and find him. Well, Sammy's family uh, has let us know that one of the things he likes to do is to curl up in small spaces. Any of these uh, spaces where you could uh, fit a small person are places that we'd want to be searching. When him and his dad went up to Crater Lake and uh, they were on a little vacation, the circumstances behind his disappearance and the subsequent inability of the Park Service to find him is unusual. And they brought in canines. Canines couldn't pick up a scent. They brought in air support. They couldn't find him. Uh, a multi, multi-day search couldn't locate the boy. Eight years earlier, another eight-year-old boy, Derek Engebretson, vanished from this spot, a densely wooded mountainside above Upper Klamath Lake, not far from Crater Lake National Park. Now we got a dog up here, I guess. We took some, some of my brother's clothes, and we got a dog up here that's going to try to sniff him out or something. Search and rescue crews spent more than 10,000 hours looking for Derek, but still haven't found a single clue. When Derek was out there with his dad and his grandpa, they somehow or another, he just walked around, didn't go far. There was snow on the ground. They should have been able to track him, and he vanishes. That's another case that you search an area, uh, you, you have good information, you, you go right to where they were, and they're just not there. I mean, after all this time, they still do a yearly search for that. They, uh, the search team goes out and does a training, and they'll go back and search that area every year. Scott Lucas is the search and rescue coordinator at Oregon's Office of Emergency Management. He says it's only one or two percent of the missions they launch that don't return answers, but they average about 900 searches a year. Multnomah County coordinator, you know, he, he told me personally a couple months ago he's baffled by the ones he can't find. He just, you know, where do they go? Where do they disappear to? Or they just don't want to be found. So, and, and that comes into play too. And yet, Oregon does have its share of miraculous and mystifying survival stories also. Just kind of got tunnel vision, you know, and just kept focusing in on walking down this one road. I really had no idea where I was going. Cody Sheehy was just six years old when he wandered off deep into the Wallawa wilderness. Search crews and two helicopters with FLIR technology couldn't find a trace of him in the rugged woods, dampened by a cold mixed snow and rainfall. In almost all these cases, they bring in helicopters with FLIR, forward-looking infrared radar, to look for heat signatures on the ground. They can't find a heat signature. That's unusual. But the next morning, 15 hours later and 20 miles away, Cody walked up to a house and asked for help. I was physically at the end of my rope that next morning. And if I hadn't been in a situation where people found me at that time, um, 
I don't know how I would have done for another night out there. I could easily have died. More than 30 years before Cody's harrowing experience, another astonishing story unfolded near Pendleton, where two and a half year old Keith Parkins ran and stumbled over a dozen miles of snow-covered timberland and mountains before he was found 19 hours later, stiff and cold, but alive. I mean, to me, being a parent, I can't see my two-year-old climbing over two mountain ranges in the dark. That, that's pretty hard to believe. And there's some cases where little kids are alleged to have walked up to 20 miles overnight or climbed phenomenal heights, three and 4,000 feet. And those are facts, and it's highly, highly hard to believe. Yeah, I'm not not as uh, overly mystical person. Um, I don't think I didn't encounter anything to my memory that was unusual, other than the fact that that situation was extremely unusual. Sheehy is alive, but the fate of others like Derek Ingebretson and Sammy Belke are why Politis keeps digging for answers. In Belke's case, we interviewed one of the local sheriffs that was involved two days after he disappeared about this incident. And I won't say what he said, but it's in the movie. It's, it's pretty stunning. At this point, Politis doesn't offer any of his own theories for what happened. He does tell me his books just report the facts of the missing persons cases and that he doesn't believe in the paranormal per se. Hello and welcome to the McGowan Theater of the National Archives in Washington, D.C. I'm Miriam Kleiman, the program director for public affairs. Before we get to today's talk, just a few promos. Please join us tomorrow evening at 7.30 p.m. as former members of Congress discuss the partisan divide, Congress in crisis. Come back this Friday at noon to see the DC premiere of the film To Tell the Truth, Working for Change, a two-part history of documentary film in the US and UK. To learn more about upcoming programs and exhibits, please take a monthly calendar of events from the racks in the lobby as you leave or go online to www.archives.gov forward slash calendar. Consider joining the National Archives Foundation, the nonprofit that supports the work of the National Archives. There's member membership applications, again, in the theater lobby right next to the calendar of events. Today's book talk is on the Nazis next door, How America Became a Safe Haven for Hitler's Men by Eric Lischblau. Eric Lischblau is a New York Times investigative reporter here at the New York Times Bureau in DC. He started at the LA Times and joined the New York Times in 2002. He's been there ever since, garnering many awards, including a Pulitzer Prize in 2006 for breaking the story of the NSA's secret wiretapping in the weeks after 9-11. He's appeared on C-SPAN, CNN, PBS, and every news show you've heard of, and many you haven't. In his free time, he's written two books, Bush's Law, The Remaking of American Justice, and the one he's here to talk about today. This book is truly a page turner. Drama and intrigue, government agency, fighting government agency, good versus evil, and the pervasive question, should these elderly Nazi war criminals be brought to justice or is it time to just move on? I found this book fascinating, starting with the cover. I'm from Cleveland. I grew up in Cleveland, home to John Demjanjuk, literally, well, not literally the Nazi next door, but the Nazi across the city. I was in elementary school when he was first identified as Ivan the Terrible. The man was evil incarnate, and I remember following the case for many years. In college, many years later, I studied in Jerusalem and attended his trial there where clearly he was so accustomed to court trials that he seemed cordial and almost jovial during the proceedings. Lischblau outlines the permutations of this case that ended just two years ago with Demjanjuk's death in Germany during yet another appeal. I also found the book of great interest because my first job with the archives was as a researcher with the Nazi war crimes interagency working group. 
the archives-based group that helped declassify the backlog of Nazi war crimes-related records. Thank you for citing many of our group's reports. One last plug. You, too, can be an investigative reporter. The National Archives holds millions of records relating to the Third Reich, the Holocaust, Nuremberg war crimes trials, and Operation Paperclip. There are stories waiting to be told and books to be written. But I don't know if any will be as gripping as the one we're here to hear about today. Please join me in welcoming Eric Lischblau to the National Archives. I tell the story um, in the book about Alan Dulles, who you see here uh, with, there we go, with uh, John F. Kennedy. Alan Dulles, uh, the brother of John Foster Dulles, was the first CIA director beginning in the 1950s under Eisenhower. Before that, though, he was a top intelligence official for uh, the OSS, the predecessor agency to the CIA in Switzerland. And there's sort of a seminal moment that I use to lead off the book where Alan Dulles, while the war was still going on in early 1945, uh, met with a leading Nazi general, a general by the name of Karl Wolf, who you see here uh, on the left, with his boss, Heinrich Himmler, the notorious SS, uh, SS chief. Um, and while the bullets were still flying in Germany, before, months before Germany's ultimate surrender, Dulles met with uh, General Wolf at a safe house in Zurich. He didn't arrest him, didn't put hands on him, didn't uh, accuse him or confront him with his war crimes. Instead, they sipped scotch by a fireside and spoke in German about mutual acquaintances. Because Dulles thought that Wolf, who controlled a lot of the SS men in Italy at that time, would, would have the power to perhaps effectuate an early surrender in Italy. Uh, ahead of Germany itself. By that point, everyone knew that Hitler was, was uh, about to be defeated. It was just a question of when. And in fact, they did get the men in Italy to surrender a few weeks earlier than everyone else. But Dulles also wanted something else that really forms the framework of my book. And that is an, an asset in this brave new Cold War that he and other US Cold Warriors are about to embark on. He saw he saw uh, Himmler's chief of staff, General Wolf, as someone who knew the Soviets, who loathed and despised the Soviets, and could uh, exploit that hatred and knowledge to wage battle with the Soviets, even before the war against Germany was over. Soviets, of course, remember, were our, uh, at least on paper, our ally at the end of the war, but people like Dulles were already looking ahead to the next Cold War. There were also men like Jacob Reimer, a Ukrainian who settled, settled in Queens and made a good living selling potato chips. Um, his visa application put him down as a POW during the war. It left out some of the more haunting aspects of his Nazi service, such as serving as a decorated officer in the SS, taking part in raids in Jewish villages, and training guards at Travniki, the infamous uh, Nazi concentration camp. Half a century later, the Justice Department prosecutors belatedly came after Reimer to deport him for his role with the Nazis. This was how one of the prosecutors explained the math of post-war immigration policies to the judge. Quote, Reimer was never entitled to immigrate to America. There were only a limited number of visas back then, and he took the, visas of a, he took the visa of a real victim. One more Nazi in America meant one fewer victim who got to come to America and enjoy the freedom and liberties that it offered them. But there were others who didn't need to sneak in like Jacob Reimer or Carl Linnis. They were people like Otto von Bolschwing, a Prussian baron who was a senior SS officer. He had help from the CIA. The CIA knew of his role with the Nazis, and yet in the 1950s hired him anyway as a spy, making about $1,700 a month plus a carton of cigarettes, uh, in Austria to spy on the Soviets as part of this new Cold War. Now, von Bolschwing, like many of the other Nazi spies hired by US intelligence services, was not a particularly good spy. It probably won't shock anyone in this room that the Nazis who we recruited as spies against the Soviets turned out uh, often to be embezzlers, thieves, cheats, liars, and even on occasion, Soviet double agents. But at the time, this did not seem apparent to the US intelligence officials who hired them. Uh, and in fact, von Bolschwing, I tell the story in the book of, of his being uh, dispatched on a train to deliver a satchel filled with uh, spy photos and documents with the names of secret agents uh, to a contact in Hamburg. 
except that he reached this destination at the end of the train and he realized that he had mixed up his bag with another person's. And instead of the spy documents inside, there were pajamas and men's toiletries. Now, if that were you or I who was, was caught in such an embarrassing episode, not to mention the fact that we used to be a Nazi, the CIA would probably fire us, I'm fairly confident. Yet, von Bolschwing, not only wasn't he fired, but the CIA whitewashed his record and brought him and his family to New York City to live as what they called a quote-unquote reward for his service in Austria. That's their word, not mine, because I can't make this stuff up. And in view of what they called the quote innocuousness of his Nazi party activities. Now innocuousness is a strange word to use when you're talking about a man who worked as a top aide before the war to this man who you may recognize is Adolf Eichmann, the, the architect of the final solution. Uh, von Bolschwing was the man who wrote in the years before the war hideous white papers for the Jewish Affairs Office, for Eichmann's uh, eyes and others, about the ways to terrorize Jews. This is a sample of his writing of a, uh, a paper called The Jewish Problem. So von Bolschwing wrote that a largely anti-Jewish atmosphere must be created among the people in order to form the basis for the continued attack and the effective exclusion of them. The most effective means is the anger of the people leading to excesses in order to take away the sense of security from the Jews. Even though this is an illegal method, it has had a long-standing effect. The Jew has learned a lot through the pogroms of the past centuries and fears nothing as much as a hostile atmosphere which can go spontaneously against him at any time. Now the CIA had in its own files evidence linking von Bolschwing directly to Nazi party activities at the highest levels. And yet, they not only brought him to the United States to live with his family, but they even covered up his activities years later when von Bolschwing was in some danger of being exposed. His old boss, Adolf, Adolf Eichmann, you may recall, was captured by the Israelis in Argentina in 1960. A, 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 brava, a, 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 a daring raid that brought headlines around the world to the problem of Nazi fugitives. And von Bolschwing himself feared that he was going to be next. So we went back to the CIA, and I tell the story in the book of a meeting that they held in New York City at a restaurant where the CIA promised him that they would protect him. They would not tell the Israelis who he was or where he was. They would not tell the Justice Department immigration officials. They would not tell anyone. And in fact, it worked. They kept his secret for another 20 years until the Justice Department uh, finally realized who he was. By that point, he was living in Northern California. And on his deathbed, he was finally confronted with his horrible crimes. This is another CIA spy. From, uh, from the Nazi regime. His name is Alexandros Lalekas, who was a Lithuanian. You see him on the left. That's a picture of him in 1938 when he was the head of a notorious uh, Lithuanian security force in, uh, in Vilnius that worked hand in hand with the Gestapo in the Nazi occupied uh, country of Lithuania to, uh, or to identify, arrest, and ultimately slaughter 60,000 Jews outside the town of Vilnius. This is a picture of some of the victims, a small fraction of the victims. And Lalekas was the one who would sign the warrants imprisoning women, children, and some men, but mostly women and children, in the local prison and then handing them over to the Gestapo where they would be led outside to, uh, to a, a killing field and, and machine gun to death. You see on the right his photo in the United States after he'd become a naturalized US citizen living in Massachusetts. He too was a CIA agent in those years after the war, working for the CIA in Europe um, as an asset in the Cold War. It was not as if the CIA did not know of his past. In fact, the files um, at the National Archives in College Park, um, you can read where the uh, CIA, in, within months of the end of the war, had determined that Lalekas was, quote, controlled by the Gestapo, end quote, in Lithuania and was connected to the mass shootings in Vilnius. And yet, they used him as a Cold War spy in Europe in the 1950s, paying him a handsome salary, plus, of course, cigarettes, and then helped him move to Massachusetts, where, like Otto von Bolschwing, he lived for years and years before he was ever confronted uh, with his crimes. He managed to fade into the Lithuanian community. He sold encyclopedias for a living. And it was another 30 years before, uh, before he was facing deportation for his crimes. Uh, I'll 
show you one last Nazi fugitive who lived right here in Washington. This was uh, a man by the name of Walter Hilger, who was uh, not anonymous by any means. This was one of Hitler's top foreign policy aides, the number two man on Soviet affairs to General Ribbentrop, who was executed in Nuremberg. Uh, Hilger, in fact, was with Hitler towards the end of the war in one of the eastern bunkers uh, and was a top advisor on the, uh, uh, the invasion of, of Russia by the Germans earlier in the war. Uh, he came to Washington. He worked for the CIA as a, as a covert analyst. He would go out to McLean. And in fact, I tell the story in the book of how he would do research here at the National Archives on a regular basis in the 1950s. Uh, and seemed to be hiding in plain sight. He was listed in the telephone book. Um, he was writing his memoirs in which he talked unapologetically about having served Hitler. Uh, there was another man doing research at the National Archives in that time, um, uh, a man by the name of um, uh, Raoul Hillman, who uh, was writing what became the definitive work on the Holocaust, the destruction of the, East, of the European Jews. And he would see Hilger sometimes sitting at the cubicle at the, the, uh, at the National Archives. And he knew that not, no one was paying any attention to him, but he refused to be in the same room with him. So whenever he saw him, he, in a sort of silent protest, would stand up and leave. That was about the best that he could hope for as a denunciation of the presence of Hilger and people like him uh, in the United States. I'll show you one more. Um, picture, uh, I'll talk just quickly and then I think we'll open it up to questions uh, about the, the Nazi scientists. Um, I talked about the mythologizing of the Nazi scientists and the idea that these were, uh, that these were Nazis in name only. This is a picture of um, a group of them in San Antonio after the war. Werner von Braun is on the right and to the left is a guy by the name of Arthur Rudolph who you see here with his uh, Nazi identification card on the swastikers. Now, Nazi in name only for Rudolf and von Braun and many others like them meant that they operated a hideous slave labor factory camp in Nordhausen, Germany, where uh, thousands of prisoners, mostly POWs from France, Russia, Poland, and elsewhere, died from uh, disease, uh, from, from uh, malnutrition, from other ailments. And if you were suspected of sabotaging the rocket parts that they were building for the V2, you were brought to the center of the factory where a giant crane was set up for the work. And you were hanged in front of the other, the other prisoners as a lesson of what would become you if you dared to mess with the Nazi machinery. Arthur Rudolph was the head of production at that facility. Yet he, like von Braun, came to America under what was known as Operation Paperclip and lived for years, not only as a free American, but as a, as a noted NASA scientist, not quite as famous as Werner von Braun, but within the Apollo space program and the Saturn pro space program, he was, was quite prominent. And it wasn't until the 1980s, uh, as in the case we saw with uh, Otto von Bolschwing and Alexander Lalekas and others, that the Justice Department finally came after him and he was allowed to return to Germany, uh, where he lived out his life. There are obviously a lot of villains in this book, but I don't want to leave you with the impression that there are no heroes. One of them was a man I'd never heard of before I started my research, a man by the name of Chuck Allen, you see here on the left. He was a left-wing journalist in the 1960s. He wrote for obscure communist publications uh, and Jewish publications. Occasionally, he would get into a prominent left-wing publication like The Nation, but for the most part, no one read his stuff. No one except for the FBI because Chuck Allen was writing about Nazis in America long before anyone else, before anyone was even aware that this was an issue. In 1963, he published a 40-page expose naming names, including Walter Hilger, the person I showed you a minute ago, the foreign affairs specialist, and others, of people who were living here in the United States uh, and living freely as Americans despite their, their war crimes. He was sort of a journalist slash activist. And you see on the right a poster from a rally that he uh, organized. He organized rallies in Brooklyn and Chicago and Los Angeles to draw attention to this problem. Now, as I said, the mainstream media and politicians, for the most part, ignored him. But the FBI didn't. J. Edgar Hoover considered him such a threat to national security because he was writing about this unpopular issue that he uh, approved a warrant to wiretap him in the 1960s and surveil him as he went around to uh, Eastern European countries to gather evidence against people in the United States and their war crimes. 
Uh, so the, the FBI and the Justice Department not only didn't act on his findings, many of which turned out to be, to be quite factual and well-founded, but they retaliated against him by declaring him a communist subversive and a national security threat. And it wasn't until 20 years later in the early 1980s that the Justice Department again belatedly began going after uh, these guys and identifying um, uh, more than 130 who they, who they actually ended up prosecuting in the United States. Uh, but by then, these guys were in their 60s and 70s. Some of them had died already. Uh, a lot of them were uh, in failing health by then. And it was unfortunately a tragic situation of too little, too late by the time the United States realized the Nazi problem it had in its own backyard. So with that, I think we'll open it up to questions. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, just jump in. These days, uh, post-traumatic stress keeps coming up by people who behaved in relatively benign things during the war, and it caused severe psychological damage for them. I, I never hear about that with Nazi <laughs> refugees. Was there, do you have any evidence that any Nazi sat there and thought, damn, that was a mistake? What did I do? No, no, for the most part, they really um, just faded into the woodwork. I mean, obviously, these were people who had every reason to, to hide their past. They did not want to draw attention to themselves. Very few of them ever had run-ins with the law. There was one guy who got into a shooting, but he was the, he was the exception. Uh, these were not um, you know, guys who were uh, on the verge of a breakdown over confronting their pasts or anything like that. Um, and uh, for the most part, they leave, lived remarkably unremarkable lives.